Chapter 12 of The House on the Borderland by William Hope Hodgson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Subterranean Pit. Another week came and went, during which I spent a great deal of my time about the pit mouth. I had come to the conclusion a few days earlier that the arched hole and the angle of the great rift was the place through which the swine things had made their exit from some unholy place in the bowels of the world. How near the probable truth this went, I was to learn later. It may be easily understood that I was tremendously curious, though in a frightened way, to know to what infernal place that hole led, though so far the idea had not struck me seriously of making an investigation. I was far too much imbued with a sense of horror of the swine creatures to think of venturing willingly where there was any chance of coming into contact with them. Gradually, however, as time passed, this feeling grew insensibly less, so that when a few days later the thought occurred to me that it might be possible to clamber down and have a look into the hole, I was not so exceedingly averse to it as might have been imagined. Still, I do not think even then that I really intended to try any such foolhardy adventure. For all that I could tell, it might be certain death to enter that doleful-looking opening. And yet such is the pertinacity of human curiosity, that at last my chief desire was but to discover what lay beyond that gloomy entrance. Slowly, as the day slid by, my fear of the swine things became an emotion of the past more unpleasant and credible memory than aught else. Thus a day came when, throwing thoughts and fancies adrift, I procured a rope from the house, and having made it fast to a stout tree at the top of the rift, and some little distance back from the pit edge, let the other end down into the cleft until it dangled right across the mouth of the dark hole. Then, cautiously and with many misgivings as to whether it was not a mad act that I was attempting, I climbed slowly down, using the rope as a support until I reached the hole. Here, still holding on to the rope, I stood and peered in. All was perfectly dark, and not a sound came to me. Yet a moment later it seemed that I could hear something. I held my breath and listened, but all was silent as the grave, and I breathed freely once more. At the same instant I heard the sound again. It was like a noise of labored breathing, deep and sharp drawn. For a second I stood petrified, not able to move. But now the sounds had ceased again and I could hear nothing. As I stood there anxiously, my foot dislodged a pebble which fell inward, into the dark, with a hollow chink. At once the noise was taken up and repeated a score of times each succeeding echo being fainter and seeming to travel away from me as though into remote distance. Then, as the silence fell again, I heard that stealthy breathing. For each respiration I made I could hear an answering breath. The sounds appeared to be coming nearer, and then I heard several others, but fainter and more distant. Why I did not grip the rope and spring up, out of danger, I cannot say. It was as though I had been paralyzed. I broke out into a profuse sweat and tried to moisten my lips with my tongue. My throat had gone suddenly dry and I coughed huskily. It came back to me in a dozen horrible throaty tones mockingly. I peered helplessly into the gloom, but still nothing showed. I had a strange choky sensation and again I coughed dryly. Again the echo took it up rising and falling grotesquely and dying slowly into a muffled silence. Then suddenly a thought came to me, and I held my breath. The other breathing stopped. I breathed again, and once more it recommenced. But now I no longer feared. I knew that the strange sounds were not made by any lurking swine creature, but were simply the echo of my own respirations. Yet I had received such a fright that I was glad to scramble up the rift and haul up the rope. I was far too shaken and nervous to think of entering that dark hole then, and so returned to the house. I felt more myself next morning, but even then I could not summon up sufficient courage to explore the place. All this time the water in the pit had been creeping slowly up, 
and now stood but a little below the opening. At the rate at which it was rising, it would be level with the floor in less than another week. And I realized that unless I carried out my investigations soon, I should probably never do so at all, as the water would rise and rise until the opening itself was submerged. It may have been that this thought stirred me to act, but whatever it was, a couple of days later, saw me standing at the top of the cleft, fully equipped for the task. This time I was resolved to conquer my shirking and go right through with the matter. With this intention I had brought, in addition to the rope, a bundle of candles, meaning to use them as a torch. Also my double-barreled shotgun. In my belt I had a heavy horse pistol loaded with buckshot. As before, I fastened the rope to the tree. Then, having tied my gun across my shoulders with a piece of stout cord, I lowered myself over the edge of the pit. At this movement, Pepper, who had been eyeing my actions, watchfully rose to his feet and ran to me with a half-bark, half-wail, it seemed to me, of warning. But I was resolved on my enterprise and bade him lie down. I would much have liked to take him with me, but this was next to impossible in the existing circumstances. As my face dropped level with the pit edge, he licked me right across the mouth. And then, seizing my sleeve between his teeth, began to pull back strongly. It was very evident that he did not want me to go. Yet, having made up my mind, I had no intention of giving up the attempt, and with a sharp word to Pepper, to release me, I continued my descent leaving the poor old fellow at the top, barking and crying like a forsaken pup. Carefully I lowered myself from projection to projection. I knew that a slip might mean a wetting. Reaching the entrance, I let go the rope and untied the gun from my shoulders. Then, with a last look at the sky, which I noticed was clouding over rapidly, I went forward a couple of paces so as to be shielded from the wind and lit one of the candles. Holding it above my head and grasping my gun firmly, I began to move on slowly, throwing my glances in all directions. For the first minute I could hear the melancholy sound of Pepper's howling coming down to me. Gradually, as I penetrated further into the darkness, it grew fainter until, in a little while, I could hear nothing. The path tended downward somewhat and to the left. Thence it kept on, still running to the left, until I found that it was leading me right in the direction of the house. Very cautiously I moved onward, stopping every few steps to listen. I had gone perhaps a hundred yards, when suddenly it seemed to me that I caught a faint sound, somewhere along the passage behind me. With my heart thudding heavily, I listened. The noise grew plainer and appeared to be approaching rapidly. I could hear it distinctly now. It was the soft padding of running feet. In the first moments of fright I stood irresolute, not knowing whether to go forward or backward. Then, with a sudden realization of the best thing to do, I backed up to the rocky wall on my right, and holding the candle above my head, waited, gun in hand, cursing my foolhardy curiosity for bringing me into such a strait. I had not long to wait but a few seconds before two eyes reflected back from the gloom the rays of my candle. I raised my gun, using my right hand only, and aimed quickly. Even as I did so, something leapt out of the darkness with a blustering bark of joy that woke the echoes like thunder. It was Pepper. How he had contrived to scramble down the cleft I could not conceive. As I brushed my hand nervously over his coat, I noticed that he was dripping, and concluded that he must have tried to follow me and fallen into the water, from which he would not find it very difficult to climb. Having waited a minute or so to steady myself, I proceeded along the way, Pepper following quietly. I was curiously glad to have the old fellow with me. He was company, and somehow with him at my heels I was less afraid. Also, I knew how quickly his keen ears would detect the presence of any unwelcome creature, should there be such amid the darkness that wrapped us. For some minutes we went slowly along, the path still leading straight toward the house. Soon I concluded we should be standing right beneath it, did the path but carry far enough. I led the way cautiously for another fifty yards or so. Then I stopped and held the light high, and reason enough I had to be thankful that I did so, 
for there, not three paces forward, the path vanished, and in place showed a hollow blackness that sent sudden fear through me. Very cautiously I crept forward and peered down, but could see nothing. Then I crossed to the left of the passage to see whether there might be any continuation of the path. Here, right against the wall, I found that a narrow track, some three feet wide, led onward. Carefully I stepped on to it, but had not gone far before I regretted venturing thereon, for after a few paces the already narrow way resolved itself into a mere ledge, with, on the one side, the solid unyielding rock towering up in a great wall to the unseen roof, and on the other that yawning chasm. I could not help reflecting how helpless I was should I be attacked there, with no room to turn, and where even the recoil of my weapon might be sufficient to drive me headlong into the depths below. To my great relief, a little further on, the track suddenly broadened out again to its original breadth. Gradually, as I went onward, I noticed that the path trended steadily to the right, and so, after some minutes, I discovered that I was not going forward, but simply circling the huge abyss. I had evidently come to the end of the great passage. Five minutes later, I stood on the spot from which I had started, having been completely round what I guess now to be a vast pit, the mouth of which must be at least a hundred yards across. For some little time I stood there, lost in perplexing thought. "'What does it all mean?' was the cry that had begun to reiterate through my brain. A sudden idea struck me, and I searched round for a piece of stone. Presently I found a bit of rock about the size of a small loaf. Sticking the candle upright in a crevice on the floor, I went back from the edge somewhat, and, taking a short run, launched the stone forward into the chasm my idea being to throw it far enough to keep it clear of the sides. Then I stooped forward and listened. But though I kept perfectly quiet for at least a full minute, no sound came back to me from out of the dark. I knew then that the depth of the hole must be immense, for the stone, had it struck anything, was large enough to have set the echoes of that weird place whispering for an indefinite period. Even as it was, the cavern had given back the sounds of my footfalls multitudinously. The place was awesome, and I would willingly have retraced my steps and left the mysteries of its solitudes unsolved. Only to do so meant admitting defeat. Then a thought came, to try to get a view of the abyss. It occurred to me that if I placed my candles round the edge of the hole, I should be able to get at least some dim sight of the place. I found, on counting, that I had brought fifteen candles in the bundle, my first intention having been, as I have already said, to make a torch of the lot. These I proceeded to place round the pit mouth with an interval of about twenty yards between each. Having completed the circle, I stood in the passage and endeavored to get an idea of how the place looked, but I discovered immediately that they were totally insufficient for my purpose. They did little more than make the gloom visible. One thing they did, however, and that was, they confirmed my opinion of the size of the opening, and although they showed me nothing that I wanted to see, yet the contrast they afforded to the heavy darkness pleased me curiously. It was as though fifteen tiny stars shone through the subterranean night. Then, even as I stood, Pepper gave a sudden howl that was taken up by the echoes and repeated with vastly variations dying away slowly. With a quick movement I held aloft the one candle that I had kept and glanced down at the dog at the same moment I seemed to hear a noise, like a diabolical chuckle, rise up from the hitherto silent depths of the pit. I started, then I recollected that it was probably the echo of Pepper's howl. Pepper had moved away from me up the passage a few steps. He was nosing along the rocky floor, and I thought I heard him lapping. I went toward him, holding the candle low. As I moved, I heard my boot go sup, sup, and the light was reflected from something that glistened and crept past my feet swiftly toward the pit. I bent lower and looked, then gave vent to an expression of surprise. From somewhere higher up the path a stream of water was running quickly in the direction of the great opening and growing in size every second. 
Again, Pepper gave vent to that deep-drawn howl, and running at me, seized my coat and attempted to drag me up the path toward the entrance. With a nervous gesture, I shook him off and crossed quickly over to the left-hand wall. If anything were coming, I was going to have the wall at my back. Then, as I stared anxiously up the pathway, my candle caught a gleam far up the passage. At the same moment, I became conscious of a murmurous roar that grew louder and filled the whole cavern with deafening sound. From the pit came a deep, hollow echo like the sob of a giant. Then I had sprung to one side on the narrow ledge that ran round the abyss, and turning saw a great wall of foam sweep past me and leap tumultuously into the waiting chasm. A cloud of spray burst over me, extinguishing my candle and wetting me to the skin. I still held my gun. The three nearest candles went out, but the further ones gave only a short flicker. After the first flush, the flow of water eased down to a steady stream, maybe a foot in depth, though I could not see this until I had procured one of the lighted candles, and with it started to reconnoiter. Pepper had fortunately followed me as I leapt for the edge, and now, very much subdued, kept close behind. A short examination showed me that the water reached right across the passage and was running at a tremendous rate. Already, even as I stood there, it had deepened. I could make only a guess at what had happened. Evidently, the water in the ravine had broken into the passage by some means. If that were the case, it would go on increasing in volume until I should find it impossible to leave the place. The thought was frightening. It was evident that I must make my exit as hurriedly as possible. Taking my gun by the stock, I sounded the water. It was a little under knee-deep. The noise it made plunging down into the pit was deafening. Then, with a call to Pepper, I stepped out into the flood, using the gun as a staff. Instantly the water boiled up over my knees, and nearly to the tops of my thighs with the speed at which it was racing. For one short moment I nearly lost my footing, but the thought of what lay behind stimulated me to a fierce endeavor, and step by step I made headway. Of Pepper I knew nothing at first. I had all I could do to keep on my legs, and was overjoyed when he appeared beside me. He was wading manfully along. He is a big dog with longish thin legs, and I suppose the water had less grasp on them than upon mine. Anyway, he managed a great deal better than I did, going ahead of me like a guide and unwittingly, or otherwise, helping somewhat to break the force of the water. On we went, step by step, struggling and gasping until somewhere about a hundred yards had been safely traversed. Then, whether it was because I was taking less care, or that there was a slippery place on the rocky floor, I cannot say, but suddenly I slipped and fell on my face. Instantly the water leapt over me in a cataract, hurling me down toward the bottomless hole at a frightful speed. Frantically I struggled, but it was impossible to get a footing. I was helpless, gasping and drowning. All at once something gripped my coat and brought me to a standstill. It was Pepper. Missing me, he must have raced back through the dark turmoil to find me and then caught and held me until I was able to get to my feet. I have a dim recollection of having seen momentarily the gleams of several lights, but of this I have never been quite sure. If my impressions are correct, I must have been washed down to the very brink of that awful chasm before Pepper managed to bring me to a standstill. And the lights, of course, could only have been the distant flames of the candles I had left burning. But as I have said, I am not by any means sure. My eyes were full of water, and I had been badly shaken. And there I was, without my helpful gun, without light, and sadly confused with the water deepening, depending solely upon my old friend Pepper to help me out of that hellish place. I was facing the torrent. Naturally, it was the only way in which I could have sustained my position a moment, for even old Pepper could not have held me long against that terrific strain without assistance, however blind, from me. Perhaps a minute passed during which it was touch and go with me, then gradually I recommenced my torturous way up the passage, and so began the grimmest fight with death, from whichever I hoped to emerge victorious. Slowly, furiously, almost hopelessly, I strove, and that faithful Pepper led me, dragged me upward and onward, until at last, ahead I saw a gleam of blessed light. It was the entrance. 
only a few yards further and i reached the opening with the water surging and boiling hungrily around my loins and now i understood the cause of the catastrophe it was raining heavily literally in torrents the surface of the lake was level with the bottom of the opening nay more than level it was above it evidently the rain had swollen the lake and caused this premature rise for at the rate the ravine had been filling it would not have reached the entrance for a couple more days luckily the rope by which i had descended was streaming into the opening upon the inrushing waters seizing the end i knotted it securely round pepper's body then summoning up the last remnant of my strength i commenced to swarm up the side of the cliff i reached the pit edge in the last stage of exhaustion yet i had to make one more effort and haul pepper to safety slowly and wearily i hauled on the rope once or twice it seemed that i should have to give up for pepper is a weighty dog and i was utterly done yet to let go would have meant certain death to the old fellow and the thought spurred me to greater exertions i have but a very hazy remembrance of the end i recall pulling through moments that lagged strangely i have also some recollection of seeing pepper's muzzle appearing over the pit edge after what seemed an indefinite period of time then all grew suddenly dark end of chapter twelve recording by john van stan savannah georgia